we are in Exodus chapter 26 today, which talks about the tabernacle itself. Now, I want to take a few moments and actually describe the tabernacle. And I've got an overhead here. Would you mind catching those slides for me? I've got an overhead here, and I sent out an email to everybody. I hope that you, uh, that you caught it. Um, this is a, a picture that I thought is one of the best I've ever seen done of the tabernacle. Now, we're going to go through and we're going to read the specifics. But what I want to do is I want to show you the inside of the tabernacle here, that what you have is back here, you have this space that is called the Holy of Holies. And this is where the Ark of the Covenant is kept back here. Now this space measures 15 by 15 by 15. It was 15 feet wide, 15 feet in, in width and length, and then 15 feet high is, uh, is the ceiling, to, from the floor to the ceiling. And so it was a 15 foot cube is what it was. If we were to think about that in, in uh, regard to things that we're familiar with, it would be comparable to maybe one and a half times the size of a, of a parking space uh, in a parking lot. Not, not a very large space, if you think about it. And then out here was the holy place, and this was measured 30 feet by 15, by 15 in height. And out here we had three items. We have the... Um, uh, the altar of incense, which we have yet to get to, but we'll get there. We have the altar of incense, and then we have the menorah here. And over here we have the table of showbread. Now last week we talked about the table of showbread and the menorah. And we saw pictures of that as, as it was displayed on the Arch of Titus that was built about 81 AD. Remember we looked at those pictures uh, because Jerusalem was destroyed in August of AD 70 by the Roman general Titus. And there was the Arch of Titus that was built about 11 years later. And on the inside of the arch, they put those uh, two pictures of the menorah and the table of showbread as they were bringing them in. And we saw those pictures. And so this was the, the place called the Holy of Holies. Now, they had these four coverings of sheets of, of uh, cloth here and goat skin. And then finally the porpoise skin on the outside, which would have made the tabernacle waterproof. Now, you'll notice some of the colors that they've chosen here. There's a purple, there's a blue, there's a red crimson. These colors here are all in accordance with Scripture, as we're about to see. And then they put cherubs here. And by the way, cherubs and seraphs, or cherubim and seraphim, as they're called in Scripture, are the only angelic beings in all of Scripture that have wings. Uh, every other reference that you see in the Bible to angels, uh, they all appear as men. They're never said to have wings. Uh, so Hollywood has totally botched it, just like they botch so many other things. Uh, but cherubim and seraphim have wings, and these are cherubim here, and they have wings on them, and these were designed to be on the, uh, uh, on the curtain itself. Now this was the dividing curtain here that divided the holy place from the holy of holies. And of course we know that the priests entered into here once a year, and that was on the Day of Atonement. Uh, when the high priest would pass beyond there, and that only with the sacrificial animal blood. And there were four pillars uh, made of acacia wood that supported this, uh, this uh, dividing fabric here. And then out here there would have been five pillars that would have uh, covered this screen that was the entrance into the tabernacle itself. Now you have these walls here that consisted of uh, acacia wood overlaid with gold, and then you have these... Uh, rods that would have gone through and supported the walls. And so whoever did this, uh, this illustration here really took the time to do it properly. I mean, as far as the color, as far as the details, as far as the, the uh, rods, just everything that they did was just very well thought out. I mean, this is a very good illustration, perhaps the best I've ever seen. Uh, and trust me, you, you get online and you Google the tabernacle, and you come up with a hundred different illustrations, and you get some people that get the dimensions right, they get certain things right, but they miss a lot of the finer details as we're about to see here in the context. But I wanted to go over this, and I wanted you to get a good, solid visual of what the tabernacle looked like, and as we read through this, you're going to see the details come out, because when you just read it for, for, for itself, it's hard to visualize. Uh, and that's why I love having some of these overhead uh, uh, presentations, because they really give you uh, a very concrete expression, you know, uh, illustration to go by. So, uh, would you mind catching up for me? Thank you, man. 
Okay, so now we're going to pick up in the notes. And this is Moses. Where is Moses? He's up on the mountain. He's receiving instruction from the Lord. And this is regarding the construction of, or the instruction regarding the tabernacle itself. And it says in verse 1, it says, Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twisted linen and blue and purple and scarlet material, and you shall make them with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. Now notice he mentions there the mentioning of cherubim there to be seen by the priest when they went inside of the tabernacle. Now this probably would have been viewed perhaps on the ceiling because these were the cloths that went over uh, the tabernacle itself. Again, they had the walls as we're about to see, but these fabrics went over the top as a tent. And so these cherubim would have been woven into the fabric so that when the priest walks into the temple, or in the, excuse me, in the temple, you have to excuse me, I may use two terms interchangeably. We sometimes do that when we're teaching. Uh, but when the, when the priest walked into the tabernacle, when he would have looked up, he would have seen these cherubs on the ceiling. And again, this would have been something that, that they and they alone would have seen as they walked in there. So he says, Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twisted linen, blue and purple, and scarlet material. And you shall make them with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. Now, by the way, these would have been... Uh, the materials that they would have taken with them out of Egypt. Remember, they've only been out of Egypt for just a few months. And remember, when they left Egypt, they left with a lot of wealth. Remember, they took about 400 years of back pay remuneration for their years of slavery. And so they left with all this uh, gold and silver and all this wealth, and this, these fabrics would have come with them as well. So the material that they're going to use to build the tabernacle most likely came with them when they came out of Egypt. Verse 2, the length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits. And a cubit being about 18 inches approximately, so this would have been about 42 feet in, in length. And the width of each curtain, 4 cubits. All the curtains shall have the same measurements. Five curtains shall be joined to one another, and the other five curtains shall be joined to one another. And again, the breaking this up into two sets of five, this perhaps made it easier to assemble. Because remember that this tabernacle had to be taken down and transported as they were moving about in the wilderness. And, and they were out there uh, for 40 years, remember, before they went into the land, before they actually went into the promised land. Verse 4, you shall make the loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtain in the first set, and likewise you shall make them on the edge of the curtain that is in the outermost in the second set. You shall make 50 loops in one curtain, and you shall make 50 loops on the edge that is, that is in the second set. The loops shall be opposite each other. Verse 6, you shall make 50 clasps of gold and join the curtains to one another with the clasps so that the tabernacle will be a unit. Now, another thing we're going to notice here is that when you work from the inside out, uh, the value of the material decreases. It goes from gold and decreases downward to bronze, and we're going to see that as well. Verse 7, he says, Then you shall make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. You shall make 11 curtains in all. The length of each curtain shall be 35 cubits, and there's a reason why there's the extra length here. And the width of each curtain, four cubits, <coughs> bless you, and the eleven curtains shall have the same measurements. You shall join five curtains by themselves and the other six curtains by themselves, and you shall double over the sixth curtain at the front of the tent. So when they put up the sixth curtain, as they hung it over, it was to hang over the front of the the tabernacle, and there was one that hung over the back of the tabernacle as well, and basically it served as the curtain for the front and the back of the tabernacle. Um, verse 11, you shall make 50 clasps of bronze, and you shall put the clasps into the loops and join the tent together so that it will be a unit. Verse 12, the overlapping part that is left over the curtains of the tent the half curtain that is left over shall lap over the back of the tabernacle. So again, the extra fabric was designed to hang over the front and the back. 
the curtain on one side and the, uh, the, the, the cubit on one side and the cubit on the other of what is left over in the length of the curtains of the tent shall lap over the sides of the tabernacle on one side and on the other to cover it. You shall make a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red and a covering of porpoise skins above it. So again, you've got these four layers of material that is used. And again, the final porpoise skins... Uh, would have made the final layer waterproof. So if they're out there and they get a good heavy downpour, the water's just going to run off. It is not going to get inside of the tabernacle and get everything wet. So again, this is uh, uh, designed to be waterproof. Verse 15, Then you shall make the boards of the tabernacle of acacia wood, standing upright, and this would be to serve as the outer walls. And this is what we looked at up here when we saw the, the outer walls. By the way, acacia wood is a very hard wood. Very hard wood. Uh, verse 16. Ten cubits, this would be 15 feet, shall be the length of each board, and one and a half cubits, the width of each. So two feet, three inches would be the width of each one. And there shall be two tenons for each board. Now, a tenon is a projection that extends out from a board that attaches into a mortise. Anybody seen that before? I've got a picture up here. If you can't see it when the lights go out again, because we're going to go back to this. But uh, a tenon is what sticks out when they cut a board sometimes. They'll, they'll cut it down, and a tenon is what sticks into a mortise. And it's where two pieces of, of wood will come together, and one piece will stick into another piece, and it basically serves as a wedge in there. It just, uh, it just attaches them together. And that's what a tenon is. And so we'll, we'll look at this here in just a little bit. So he says in verse 17, There shall be two tenons for each board fitted to one another. Thus you shall do for all the boards of the tabernacle. And you shall make the boards for the tabernacle, twenty boards for the south side. And you shall make forty sockets of silver... Under the twenty boards, two sockets under one board for its two tenons, and two sockets under the other board for its two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, twenty boards, and for their forty sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, and two sockets under another board. So basically, you get the idea that these, uh, that these served as a foundation in which the boards would stand. Um, verse... 22, for the rear of the tabernacle to the west, you shall make six boards. You shall make two boards for the corners of the tabernacle at the rear. And they shall be double beneath, and together they shall be complete to its top, to the first ring. Thus it shall be with both of them. They shall form the two corners. There shall be eight boards with their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under one board and two sockets under another board. And then you shall make their bars of acacia wood, five for the boards of one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle for the rear side of the west. Now remember, these are the bars here. I don't know if you can see that too clearly, but remember the bars that ran through the sides. That's what he's describing are those bars that would have been run through those rings. So you've got these rings that are constructed in each board, and these bars would have run through, and again, this serves as a structural support. So what we have here is, uh, in effect, Moses the engineer, the uh, structural engineer, and he's uh, receiving instructions, and he's got to write all this down, because again, this is going to be designed, this is going to be put together, this is actually going to be constructed. Okay, going on, verse 28, the middle bar in the center of the board shall pass through from end to end. You shall overlay the boards with gold and make their rings of gold as, hoarders, as holders for the bars, and you shall overlay the bars with gold. Then you shall erect the tabernacle plan according uh, to that which you have been shown in the mountain. Now that's what chapters 35 through 40 are. Chapters 35 through 40 in the book of Exodus are in effect them executing what the Lord is here telling them to do. So here we have again Moses up on the mountain. He's up there. He's receiving this instruction. He's writing all this down. And then in Exodus 35 through 40, you have the people gathering together and the artisans and the craftsmen getting together and they're actually building this thing. 
And that's, that's what is recorded there in Exodus 35 through 40. So here's the instruction. In those chapters, we have the construction. Verse 31, you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material. Remember that? We looked at the blue and the purple and the scarlet. Remember, we saw that in the tabernacle. You shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet material and fine twisted linen. It shall be made with cherubim, the work of a skillful workman. Now that was the cherubim that were again on the face of the veil. So again, when you are a priest and you walk in, you're going to see cherubim on the ceiling, most likely, and you're going to see cherubim on the face of the veil. Now this is what they would have seen as they walked in, and what they would have seen day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, for the whole time that the tabernacle was in existence until the time that the temple was built under the reign of who? Who built the temple? Solomon did. Yeah. And so we have these, uh, these uh, very clear instructions. Um, verse 32, you shall hang it on four pillars. You shall hang it on four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold, their hooks also being of gold, on four sockets of silver. You shall hang up the veil under the clasps, and you shall bring in the ark of the testimony there within the veil. And so you have God telling Moses where the ark was to be. It was to be behind the veil. So again, this clear description of where the items are to be laid out. And we'll come back to that here in just a minute. Uh, and he says, And the veil shall serve for you as a partition between the holy place, what is in the Hebrew called the Kodesh, and the holy of holies, or the Kodesh HaKodeshim, what I've mentioned before. And he says in verse 34, you shall put the mercy seat. And remember, we talked about the mercy seat from the Hebrew word kaporeth, which means a place of propitiation. And propitiation is that important theological word that means what? Satisfaction. Satisfaction. Because God is a righteous God. And he can only do one thing with sin, and that is to condemn it. He cannot wink at it. He cannot dismiss it. He cannot simply excuse it away. God can only do one thing with sin, and that is to condemn it. But what God also teaches in this whole system here is the idea of substitutionary atonement. Remember, we talked about that. Because the animal that was brought to, to be sacrificed died in the place of the sinner. That the, that the innocent animal that came and died, died in the place of the sinner. And the blood that was brought on the Day of Atonement, according to Leviticus 16, the blood that was brought in, was brought in to the holy place and was sprinkled on where? On the mercy seat. Or the place of propitiation. Where God's righteousness was satisfied with the death of the animal. By the way, go with me over to Leviticus real quick. Let me, let me go over there real quick. Leviticus chapter 16. We have just a few moments. Leviticus chapter 16. Now in Leviticus chapter 16, you have... Uh, you have the law of the Day of Atonement. And he says here, uh, starting in verse 1, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, remember Nadab and Abihu, according to Leviticus chapter 10, when they had approached the presence of the Lord and died. Verse 2, And the Lord said, Tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place, into the veil... So Leviticus 16, he tells him he shall not enter into the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, or he will die, for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Aaron shall enter the holy place with this, the blood of a bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen tunic and the linen Undergarment shall be next to his body, and he shall be girded with the linen sash and attired with the linen turban. These are holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in water and put them on. 
Verse 5, He shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Then Aaron shall offer the bull for the sin offering, which is for himself. And that's interesting because, again, he's human. He has his own sin. And even the priest and the high priest had to have their own sin atoned for. So he was to have this as a sin offering for himself that he may make atonement for himself and for his, for his household. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of the meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats and one lot for the Lord and, and, and one lot for the scapegoat. Remember the scapegoat was the one goat that was released into the wilderness. Remember that? And then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the, for the Lord fell and make a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. And then it goes on how she, he will take the fire pan and the coals and place it upon the altar of the incense. And then he will go into the uh, Holy of Holies. And once he's in there, he will then sprinkle the blood upon the altar. And then Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Leviticus 17, 11, a verse I think everybody should have underscored in their Old Testament. Very important verse. He says, For the life of the flesh... Is in the blood. Now here he's talking about animals. And I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. And so clearly God has established this system to teach them the idea of atonement. To teach them the idea of substitutionary atonement. That the animal is dying in the place of the one who brings the animal, the, the representative. That he's dying in place of the sinner, the one who deserves the punishment. And so again, when we look at the mercy seat here, that when the high priest goes in there on that day of atonement and he sprinkles that blood on there, again it's that mercy seat, it's that place of propitiation. So again, verse 34 in our notes here, he says, You shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the Holy of Holies. You shall set the table, this would be the table of showbread, outside the veil, and the lampstand opposite the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And you shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen for the doorway of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet material of fine twisted linen, the work of a weaver. You shall make five pillars of acacia wood for the screen and overlay them with gold, their hooks also being of gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. Would you mind hitting those lights for me one more time, please? I'm getting to work out this morning, I know. Thank you. Okay, so let's do uh, one more look over on this because I just want to make sure everybody has a good visual in their head. When you read through the text and you just see just the text, be honest. It's hard to get a visual, isn't it? I mean, I read through it probably five or six times, and I read through it, and I'm thinking, man, you know, what, what is this? What, what, are these, what are these poles for? Where are they? And you read through it, and it's hard to get a good visual. And, um, and sometimes you feel, like there's, uh, you feel like you struggle to understand what this looks like. And so, again, I think the artist here did a really good job showing the four layers of the fabric that was used and even here, uh, and you can kind of see that they hit it at it, just like you see the cherubim here, you have the, the, the purple, the blue, the scarlet material here, you have the cherubim here, and it looks like that's a cherubim right there. Am I, am I just seeing things, or does that look like they tried to get a cherubim in there too? Am I just seeing it's just my imagination? Anyway. So anyway, we have here, we have the walls, we have the poles, it's all overlaid with gold. We have the four layers uh, with the cloth uh, on the roof here, same as the cloth that was used for the veil. We have the four columns here that the veil hung on. Uh, and then finally the porpoise skin on the outside that would have been used as the waterproof layer. Again, the 15 by 15 by 15 cube here, which was the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was. And the mercy seat is actually the lid. It's actually the lid that goes on top 
of the ark itself. And there were two cherubim, remember, that faced each other, whose wings came up and faced each other uh, over the ark of the covenant. And, uh, and so we have that here. And by the way, what were the items that were inside the ark of the covenant? Anybody? We have Aaron's, death. Aaron's rod, right, the budded. We have the pot of manna. And then we have the law. Okay? And we'll talk about that more later on. But anyway, we see the pictures here where the poles were used. We see the table of showbread, the menorah, uh, the altar of incense. And by the way, again, when the priest comes in on the Day of Atonement, he's going to come in here. He's going to come in on the Day of Atonement. He's, he's going to have his fire pan with him. And with the hot coals that would have been taken from the bronze altar outside, he's going to have a, a basin that's going to have the blood in it. And he's going to walk in here and he's going to put hot coals right here on the altar of incense. And once the incense begins to burn, he's then going to part the veil back. Now they only did this once a year, remember. Once a year. And he's going to part the veil back. And when he parts the veil back, the smoke from the incense is going to bellow into the Holy of Holies. It's going to go inside there. And he is going to walk in. Now, now, do you think he was nervous? I would be. I mean, Aaron already knew that two of his sons, Nadab and Abihu, had been struck dead because of their irreverence to the Lord. Remember we talked about that in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, how they took strange fire, remember? And they brought it in and put it on the altar of incense. And what, what happened? The Lord struck them dead. And so Aaron knows that when he comes in here, do you think he's going to have a healthy sense of fear, a healthy fear and respect for the Lord? You better believe it. So he comes in here and he, he's going to put this, and he's going to make sure everything's right. He's going to put the, the coals on here. He's going to put the incense on there. And then when he walks into this Holy of Holies, which again was just a one-time shot once a year to be repeated on and on and on, he's going to come in and then he's going to put that blood, he's going to sprinkle that blood on top of the mercy seat. And again, this would have been a repeated event for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And by the way, again, this was never cleaned off. It was never cleaned off. I mean, year after year they would have gone in and done this. Hundreds and hundreds of years. Until the time uh, of, of the Exodus, or not the Exodus, but the time of the exile in 586 B.C. Uh, under Nebuchadnezzar. And so you would almost have about 900 years that this blood is being sprinkled on there. One has to wonder what that looked like, you know. And certainly there were certain aromas that would have been inside there. You know, the smell of the bread, because they made that on a weekly basis. The smell of the oil that would have been burning in the incense. Uh, the smell of the incense that would have been burning on the altar here. I mean, there would have been certain smells you know, that would have been associated with the tabernacle as well. So, you know, again, one can try to use your imagination when, when to kind of visualize and put yourself there. And the priests were working in there daily. Remember, the priests had to come in and change the oil and the wicks on these things every morning and every evening. Every morning and every evening. Every morning and every evening they were to come in and do this. And the priests came in and replaced the bread once a week. And so, again, they would have been every... Every week coming in, and one can imagine the smell of fresh bread once a week coming in there. What kind of aromas would have been there? What kind of sights? What kind of sounds? What, what would they have heard, you know? Um, again, they're inside a tent. If you've been inside a tent and you've heard sounds, you know, that are associated with being inside a tent, you can imagine what that was like. Uh, so again, you know, you can kind of use your imagination on some of this as well. So, anyway, one last time. Thank you. And of course, that's the picture of the tin in there if you caught that in the last few seconds. So. Okay, uh, so let's take up some summary points here on, uh, on, um, on Exodus chapter 26. And by the way, one of the things that we've talked about many times before is that whenever you are listening to a, uh, a Bible teacher, uh, one question that you always ought to ask yourself is, do I understand the biblical passage better after the sermon than before. Because again, that's one thing that we've always talked about is, uh, is you know, I've, I've, I can't tell you the number of times that I've heard a sermon where a pastor starts off into a passage and then he'll start talking about something and then he's off over here and he's off over there and he tells a personal story and a few jokes and, and he may share some important theological truths, but by the time he finishes the sermon, if I ask myself, do I understand the passage that he started with? 
Do I understand the passage better after the sermon than before? Many times the answer is no, I do not. Because he'll go off and he'll talk about a lot of things and he'll break from the passage. And really what a pastor ought to be doing is he ought to be explaining the text. He ought to be going verse by verse by verse by verse through a book of the Bible. And as he goes through a section of scripture, he ought to be explaining it in such a way that he ought to be explaining it historically. He ought to be explaining it culturally. He ought to be explaining it linguistically. He ought to be explaining it theologically. And when you walk away from the sermon, you should be able to ask yourself, do I understand the passage better after the sermon than before? Okay? And if you answer yes, then the pastor has succeeded in teaching the text. If, you, if the answer is no, then you may have learned a lot of things, but you haven't learned the biblical text. And so that's a good question to ask. It's a very simple question, but I think it's a good question. So let's see if we can wrap up some summary points here. Point number one, the central idea of the text is that the Lord provides Moses specific instructions regarding the material and dimensions of the tabernacle and the placement of the furniture in such a way that shows his holiness is separate from that which is common. And by the way, if you were outside of the tabernacle, if you were not a priest, you never saw the inside of these things. You never saw the inside of the temple or the tabernacle. You didn't see the cherubim. You didn't get to see the, the, the table of showbread. And it was really up to the priest to go in and to be able to perform these functions on a daily basis, day after day, week after week, year after year, because it was the service of worship to the Lord. Point number two, the total space of the tabernacle was 45 feet long by 15 feet wide by 15 feet high. The Holy of Holies was a 15 foot cube. And the holy place was 30 feet long by 15 feet wide by 15 feet high. So that's the dimension. So it's not, not a very big place when you think about it. In the New Testament, the tabernacle typifies the heavens where God dwells. It typifies Christ's work on the cross. It typifies the believer's body as a dwelling for the Holy Spirit and also the church. And these primarily are references that you find in the book of Hebrews. <coughs> Probably one of the more understandable passages about Christ himself is, is found in the Gospel of John. Chapter 1. We know John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was, with, was, was the Word, and the Word was what? With God, and the Word was God. And what does John 1.14 say? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Dwelt among us. Literally tabernacled among us. And just as there was a point in time where you had this simple tabernacle that was built and God's glory came down inside of this tabernacle, so you have in effect Christ God the Son coming into the world and taking upon Himself humanity. And you have the glory of the Son of God in effect being veiled while He is in His humanity. Now can we think of a time when the glory of the Son of God was opened? Anybody? During the time of His ministry on the earth? The Mount of Transfiguration. Yes. And several of the Gospels mention it when Moses goes up, Moses, when Jesus goes up on the mount, and remember who appeared up there, but Moses and Elijah, remember? And his glory shone forth. And in effect, his humanity was peeled back for just a moment so that his glory shone forth. And just as the tabernacle concealed the glory of the Lord, so the humanity of Christ concealed the glory of the Son of God. And there is that similarity there. Mark chapter 9 gives us a picture of that. Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 2, it says, Six days later Jesus took with Him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves, and He was transfigured before them. Mark 9.3 says, And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, 
as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them along with Moses as they were talking with Jesus. So one can imagine. Here's Peter and James and John and they're up here on this mount. And the glory of the Son of God shines forth and then all of a sudden there's Moses and Elijah there. And then what does Peter say? Verse 5, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Oh yeah. Wish, wish he'd had a video camera. <laughs> Put it on YouTube. And Peter said G, uh, to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. And then he says, let us make, what? Three tabernacles. <laughs> right? One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now the text really tells us what's going on. Verse 6, for he did not know what to say. For they were, became terrified. You see, Peter just throws out this statement, but really he's, he's afraid. He's caught off guard. He really doesn't know what to say. He should have just been quiet. It's really what he should have done. Verse 7, then a cloud formed over, then a cloud formed overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And then all at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. And so in effect, again, the tabernacle becomes a type of Christ. Of that glory that is concealed within this very simple, simple framework. Point number three. The veil that hung between the holy place and the holy of holies symbolized separation from God. And only the high priest could go beyond the veil once a year on the Day of Atonement. And only with animal blood from an atoning sacrifice. The veil, which also was a symbol of Jesus' body, was torn in two on the day when Jesus died, showing that access to God had been granted through the death of Christ. And Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20, 19 and 20 says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He inaugurated for us through the veil that is His flesh. And so there the veil becomes a type of His body. And we know in Matthew chapter 7, excuse me, Matthew 27, go with me over there. Matthew 27, verse 50. And here we have Christ upon the cross in which He has borne the wrath of God that rightfully belongs to us. And it says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up His spirit. So after crying out, his spirit leaves his body. At that moment, he is, he is then dead upon the cross. And notice verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook, and the rocks were split. And the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after His resurrection, they appeared in the holy city and appeared to many, and entered the holy city and appeared to many. But here Jesus is upon the cross, and He cries out. And what happens? What happens inside the temple? That veil which many have said was as much as four to five to six inches in thickness. I mean, you couldn't put a team of wild horses together to tear this thing apart. We're talking about a fabric that was so thick. And yet at the moment that he cries out, at the moment that he gives up his spirit, 
It says, and behold, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. It was just simply ripped like a piece of paper. Ripped right in two. And the earth shook and the rocks were split. Now, if you were standing outside of the temple and you were looking in and you saw the, the curtain there, if you saw the veil, for that moment that that curtain was, that that veil was ripped in two, you would have looked right into the Holy of Holies. And you would have saw something that only the high priest would have seen once a year. You could have looked right in. Because the veil that separated was ripped in two. It was no longer there. Because the way had been cleared. Because the body of Christ had been given up as a sacrifice. And that imagery is so powerful. It's so powerful. I have a quote here from Dr. Merrill F. Unger. He says, Designed to separate the holy place from the most holy place, the veil typifies the sinless humanity of Christ. Barring interest into the holiest, it was eloquently expressive of the truth that by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified. And torn supernaturally from top to bottom when Christ died, it gave instant access to God to all who came by faith in His Son. And he absolutely nails it. 